Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of CNC Basecamp. Now, when we talk about V carving, everyone thinks about lettering and signs, and V carving is fantastic for that. But V carving is an underrated function, and it can do a lot more. Not only can it do lettering, but it can do intricate geometric patterns. It can take a plain piece of material and make it really interesting and ready to use for all sorts of projects. And we can add embellishments to our work as well. So we're gonna do three projects today, a breadboard and two boxes. It's gonna be fun. The DXF files are available to you on our website. So stick around as we explore V-carving. All right, well, first off, let's talk about the different kinds of V-bits that you can use. There are typically three varieties. This one is a 90 degree bit. This is a 60 degree, and finally a 30 degree. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference in the angle. So when would you use which? The 90 degree bits are best for large, broad work. So large signs, uh, large, fairly large patterns. As we go down in size, let's say a 30 degree bit, the real advantage to a 30 degree bit is it really picks out details. So when you're doing small lettering, small work, that works fantastic. It gives steeper sides and therefore you get good shadow lines and things really pop out. The disadvantage with a bit like this, a 30 degree, is that in order to get to the bottom of the V, they can really start to cut very deep. So even that little bit on small lettering can be going down a quarter, even three eighths more into your work. And sometimes you don't want that. Now you can always set a maximum depth of cut and so that 30 degree bit might only cut an eighth of an inch, but then it's going to create a flat on the interior. And so selecting the right bit is often a matter of choosing which bit will cut all the way down and give crisp, clean lines for your work, not a lot of flat, good definition, and get the job done in a reasonable amount of time. So let's go to our first project and we'll talk a little bit more about this. This project is a simple breadboard. My stock size is approximately 12 by 12 inches. I've chosen a piece of mahogany that's one inch thick, but a three quarter inch board will work fine too. As you can see, we've got lettering on the outside and a geometric pattern in the inside. Now that pattern was inspired by chip carving and that's a fantastic resource for us. There are a lot of chip carving books out there. It's a fantastic craft, and the patterning works well for us in the CNC world. The exterior, that lettering, I'm gonna use a 60 degree bit for a little more definition. The interior, I'm using a 90 degree bit. If I were to use a 30 degree bit, what would happen? Well, I would be diving very deep within the interior of these sections, deeper than I would want. So we're gonna choose the right bit to get the right definition and the right depth. So with that, let's go ahead and I'm gonna fire up the machine and we're gonna go ahead and start carving this geometric pattern on the interior of our breadboard. Well, here's our breadboard all finished up off the machine. A couple things left to do. I'm going to put a round over on the top edge and the lower edge, give everything a light sanding, and then treat it with some food safe finish. I think it's going to look sharp. This sort of combination of the geometric pattern and the writing is fantastic for all sorts of things. I'm thinking trivets, cheese boards, bread boards, cutting boards. And what would be a lot of fun is to simplify the pattern, shrink it down, and make a set of coasters, each with an individual saying. 
So a lot of fun to be had combining geometric patterns and a little bit of writing. So with this done, let's go ahead and move on to our next project. Our next project is going to be a box, and I found a wonderful picture of an antique Japanese writing box, and I've used that as a source of inspiration. I love the big heavy box joints on the ends and the iron nails. Also, if you'll notice, there's a handle built into the ends as well. Now, to make this box extra special, I'm going to use some V-carving on it. So let's move out of Inventor and to Vectric. Here's a picture of a pair of koi that we're going to V-carve into the top of the box. I found a wonderful photograph of a chip-carved koi, and I used that as a point of inspiration, as a beginning point to redraw and reshape and reproportion to fit my project. An easy way to find material to begin a project with is to go to the internet and simply do a search of drawing of fish, dog, bird, whatever. That will usually give you a pretty good selection of material and you can use that as a beginning point to do your own work. Now once I've drawn my fish and placed them where I wanted them on the material, I then went ahead and selected the proper tool paths and parameters. In this case, I'm using a 60 degree bit and I'm using a total depth of 0.25 inches. And that way I'm limiting the total depth the bit's going to extend into my top. With that done, I've exported it into the proper format, in this case for our Woodsmith CNC, which has a post-processor type of G-code inch. And so with that, I think we're ready to go ahead and carve the koi for our next project. Another really cool thing you can do with V-carving is to transform an otherwise bland surface into something really special. Now what I've done here is just taken plain birch plywood and I've created a wood grain pattern on it. I found a pattern that I liked, drew it out, and created the necessary file for V-carving. And what makes V-carving fantastic for doing things like this is, unlike a, um, an end mill, when we come to the end of a line, the bit lifts up, and so we don't get that usual you know, half semicircular round look. And the V bit is going deeper in some areas, shallower in others, depending on the width of the two lines that guide it. And therefore you get variation rather than constant rapidity. And we can do something like wood graining, but also think of all the other different patterns you could do. I am thinking things like uh, water would be very inspiring. Things with swirls, ripples, all of that would work really well. And it's simple to do, it's pretty fast, and it takes a material that's, like I said, plain and elevates it. Besides birch plywood, think about MDF. Now that's the ultimate in bland, but if we wood grain it or use some kind of a pattern on it, we can really bring it up. And you know, if you're working away at your Etsy empire right now, you got to worry about the cost of materials and how you can make things look great, and this is one way you can. Well, I've got all the parts together to assemble our koi box. Got the lid, bottom, two sides, ends, and two handles. Box of nails, glue, plenty of clamps, I think I'm all ready to go. I'm going to start just by assembling the two sides and the ends. The handles will come a little bit later. I used a, um, oh, about a three inch or half inch chisel, and I went ahead and cleaned out the fillets that our CNC machine created. I just thought for this project, I would rather have a um, nice clean appearance with sharp corners rather than having to deal with those fillets. Sometimes they're okay, and sometimes I just seem not see them.
So I'm going to go ahead and temporarily clamp it to my workbench so that I can drill and get the nails in place. I'm going to make sure that my clamp is centered on these two fingers because I don't want to over clamp and bend in the uh, ends at all. I have to make sure all my sides and ends remain flat. So with things clamped in place, I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill because the nails I'm going to use are these right here. These are a one inch decorative wrought iron nail and they're really going to be attractive I think. So that the broadest part of the nail, because they're not square, they get a little bit rectangular, I want the broadest part of the nail so that it pushes in the same direction as the grain and not against it and that'll help prevent splitting. So I'm going to flip my box over now, and because I've got these nail heads exposed on this side, I'm going to prop it up on a piece of scrap. And now I'll go ahead and reclamp the box just like I did before. Along with cleaning out all the fillets with a chisel, I also took a small file and I put a slight bevel on all of my edges because I wanted to accentuate the box joints just a little bit because the box joints and the nails are what makes this special. Now I'm going to set the sides and ends with the bottom facing up. Now it's time to attach the bottom. Now the bottom I went ahead and just cut on the table saw. It just made good sense to do it that way. I took a block plane and I chamfered all the edges just a little bit. Now with Japanese carpentry boxes and with the writing box that I found, the bottoms are always solid wood just nailed in place. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use just a little bit of glue in the center of the ends to allow for a little movement. And rather than using these decorative nails, and the head of course is going to scratch whatever we set this box on, I'm just going to use some gun nails and fire a few pins into each side. And that should allow the bottom to move a little bit and it's going to be authentic to the style of construction. And there we go. That's the bottom. Next up is the handles. Now I've got plenty of good face grain gluing area, so I'm going to take advantage of that and apply a little bit of glue to the back of each handle. And now we're going to move on to the top. So as with the bottom, I pre-cut this on the table saw. This made sense to do it that way. Added some bevels. And so that the top would register on my box, I went ahead and cut a liner, face glued it to the bottom of my top, and beveled those edges slightly so it would go in. And there we go. Simple, easy to do, with a little help from our CNC router. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at what we've built today. Here we have our breadboard, which could also be a trivet, which could also be a cheese board, which could also be downsized into a coaster. And the techniques here are the lettering. In this case, I used a 60 degree bit for a slightly crisper lettering because of the font style and because of the size. Larger lettering, a 90 degree bit would work well. Smaller lettering, a 30 degree. In the interior here, we have a nice geometric pattern. Those are great fun to do. Books about chip carving are full of fantastic patterns. That's a good place to start. Also, in your drawing program, be sure to use the rectangular and circular array to help you out in laying out geometry patterns like this. It's really great fun. Here we have our Japanese-styled box. And we used V-carving to add this attractive embellishment on the top. And this is a really versatile way to use V-carving and to really help out your work. Now, you can find images fairly easily from a lot of different sources. And then you can begin to break them down depending on, in this case, whether it's the head, fins, tail, 
and use a different set of geometries for each one. It takes a little practice, but it's not that hard to do, and it really is a fantastic way to use V-carving to add an attractive embellishment to your work. This is a box that we didn't talk about, but it uses this idea of transforming a rather bland product into something very interesting. And you can see with this little box here, it really takes it to another level. And I, what I'm thinking about is all the different finishing options I could use. This box, I'm probably going to put some hinges and a small hasp. Now, if you'd like to use the koi pattern that you see here, it'll work just fine on this box lid. So you could create this box out of solid wood if you'd like as an option to the Japanese writing box. So, a lot of different techniques that you can use V-carving on. I hope I've inspired you to think about it and incorporate it in your next project. Now, the DXF files for everything you see here are going to be located on our website, including the wood grain pattern. So they're there, and I hope you use them and have a little fun with them. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me again next month for another episode of CNC Basecamp. Part of owning a CNC machine is buying router bits, probably a few more router bits than we'd like to be paying for. One of the choices in buying a router bit is do I get plain carbide or do I get a coated bit? You know, the coatings cost a little more money, and I'm already paying a lot of money for the bit. So here's what I'm doing. Whenever I have a bit that I know is going to see hardware and hard service, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and get the coating. As an example, the two bits here are both metal cutting bits for brass and aluminum. I know they're going to see some work, and so I think the coating's worthwhile for those. Next up, these two are both plastic cutting bits, and that's the Amana Spectra line. You know, plastic can be kind of gummy. It can be difficult, and heat's a problem. So once again, I think probably the coating is a good idea. This bit is for carving work, and there's an awful lot of wear at the very tip. That's a tapered 1 32nd inch ball nose. So I want that bit to last as long as I can because it's really going to be going back and forth over the carvings. Next to it is just a plain carbide straight bit. And so that's one of my regular service bits. And I think it's probably fine as is. Now the best thing that we can do to preserve our router bits is by making sure we are using the right feed rate and the right depth of cut. So of course the general rule is the depth of cut is approximately half the diameter of the bit with the exception of harder materials like the metals, and then you really want to ease up on the depth of cut. Probably the most important thing, then, is our feed rate. We want to go fast enough that we're really producing chips and not allowing heat buildup. The coatings have a couple of advantages. One is they're much sharper, and they maintain the sharpness of the bit. Two, heat. They really do a better job of dissipating heat than an uncoated bit. And heat kills router bits. We really want to watch that. Also, the coatings provide lubricity for the bit. In other words, it's a fine structure, a fine grain structure. So materials are less likely to build up on the bit. We've all seen our table saws get kind of gummy and nasty. Well, the coatings will help prevent that on your router bits. And finally, the coatings make the bit much harder at the edge, as much as two or two and a half times. So all that adds up to a sharper bit and a longer lasting bit. So, is it worth it? I think so, but I think it's only worth it on your really hard service bits. Otherwise, go for plain carbide. <music>